Okay, thanks everyone for joining, um, especially those of you who might be um, in the middle of a, a snowstorm like the two presenters are here. Um, I'm Jennifer Kemp. I am the, an outreach manager here at Crossref, and I, I think I've probably been in touch with um, all of you individually, but um, if not, you'll hear from me again uh, after this call. I'm going to talk just briefly and then turn things over to our product director, Jennifer Lynn. Um, I'll wait just a second uh, for the, the slide to come up, just so you have an idea of uh, what the agenda is. And then I have one slide, and I will turn things over to the other Jennifer. So, um, so I guess the slides didn't pop up. Is, can you confirm before? I now. Um, they were up briefly. Okay, so let me let's get back to that. Okay. And there we go. Can you see them now? Yep, I see the agenda slide. Great, thank you. Okay. And I'm going to play that. Very good. Oh, they disappeared again. Okay. <laughs> so I think when we press play, it disappears. Um, so we'll keep it like this. Um, so I don't see them now. Do you want me to? Uh, I can pull up my own agenda slide here, maybe. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I, I, Like I said, I have just a few comments to make before I, I turn things over to uh, Jennifer Lynn. So um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you can advance to the, to the next slide. Uh, but just go ahead and jump in anytime if you have questions, either audio or in the uh, chat function in the control panel. Um, so like I said, I, um, I'm, I'm an outreach manager here at Crossref, and I started in this role last year. Crossref actually decided to bring somebody on specifically to work with affiliates, and affiliates are, are mostly non-publishers who work with uh, metadata and aggregate, and in the case of the hosting platforms, uh, those are what we call service providers, and what we found is that um, it, I spend probably as much time talking to publishers as I do to affiliates um, because it, it's we found that, you know, publishers don't always quite um, understand, you know, really what happens with their metadata. And of course, the, the platforms are so key to this because you guys handle so much of the deposits of the metadata and and give visibility to a lot of this work, you know, through through. Um, the display of DOIs or the display of Crossmark and other things like that. So we've really decided to put some focus uh, on this group um, to to move it from something that's a little more um, sort of transactional, like the uh, you know just making those deposits, to something that's a little bit more collaborative and a little bit more strategic because we do all work um, you know with these publishers and we found that you know things are really moving beyond just just sort of the DOI and just making these deposits. Um, there's there's so much more metadata involved now than the very basic bibliographic metadata that was the focus of a few years ago. So um, what uh, what we're hoping to do, and I know we do in some cases, is to 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 speak with um, to speak with you regularly to have a sort of uh, counterpart um, on your side um, so that we can you know touch base on issues. Um, when there are new services coming out, we can be a little bit more proactive in communicating those to you, like the DOI display guidelines that we announced in the fall. Um, so, so things like that, a little bit of a you know, mixed bag of um, operational stuff, strategic stuff, and, and outreach. So, for example, we are you know, more than happy to attend your user group meetings, whether as presenters or, or just to attend, and we're very happy to have you attend our meetings. And you you may know that we have an annual, what we used to call our annual member meeting, um, which was sort of a misnomer because you know members are publishers to Crossref and we really have a lot of other uh, people and sort of um, types of organizations attending than just publishers. And we, th and we think it's good for uh, affiliates to talk with publishers. That, that's really one of the focuses of, of my work here. So our annual meeting this year will be in Singapore, probably a little, <laughs> a little bit far um, for some of you to attend, um, although it is, there's still no uh, registration fee, so in case that helps. But um, we also have more regional 
uh, day uh, presentations and workshops um, that we call live. Um, so our next live meeting is in Boston. It will be uh, the Tuesday of SSP week. So I'll let you know when we get details for that. But, but that's the sort of thing that you're, you're very welcome to join. And I hope that in some of our follow up discussions, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what the service provider program is, you know, what what we're uh, all getting out of it and how we might, you know, tweak it to make things, uh, you know, prove things for everybody, and make it a little bit more mutually beneficial and, and you know, iron out any kinks and things like that. So we wanted to set this up early in the year. So you have an idea of, you know, what we're hearing from publishers um, and others in the community like funders. Um, and to give you an idea of sort of what our priorities are, because of course, some of these might uh, require development effort on your part, or you might hear questions from publishers and we wanted to give you the, uh, the information that you might need that we have at this point and we can uh, continue the conversation from here. So it would be good to know if this works out for you or if you have any other ideas about how to collaborate, uh, definitely let me know. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer Lynn. Thanks, Jennifer. So we have chosen four different topics um, that we're going to try to squeeze in this short amount of time. And um, we could talk all day about any number of them. As Jennifer mentioned, to the extent that there are additional topics that you'd like to cover in future gatherings, please do let us know. These four that we selected really are just ones that are at the top of our list. Um, and. Um, some of which ha have been around for quite a while, but we are spending more time um, providing and crafting more materials and educational um, information about them because they're lesser understood. Others have not yet launched, um, and so these are these items are, are to give you a heads up as to um, what's coming down the pipeline. We know that you have you work with your customer publishers and some you know there's a lot of things that they've been thinking about. So we hope that partly um, one of the benefits in our two groups staying much more well connected is to keep you uh, um, informed ahead of the curve so that when your customers come to you um, there you can provide more information of, um, in, in, in the areas where Crossref might be. Um, tied to your service. So as you well know, um, as a group probably far more than most in our massive research market landscape is that we work on metadata and that what metadata does is it, it, it enables connections. Um, you know, we have a wide variety of players, whether it's the publishers that you directly work with, the researchers that um, they work with the funders, the research institutions, other repositories um, and entities that also now have come into the landscape, which um, are a way for researchers to share other outputs. All of these historically have not been mapped well. And so what we are trying to do is increasingly add to this larger graph, if you will, of connections and um, continue to make this much more usable um, by you as a platform provider, um, by the researchers, by other vendors that may be um, developing tools and other services. And the most obvious type of links um, or mappings that, that we do, you're well aware of. Linking the article on your hosting platform to, say, the authors, um, reviewers, the funders, and affiliations. This is a class of links that we call the literature linking to associated research entities. But increasingly, um, many of you are perhaps involved in some of these discussions about data and software. Um, there is um, more of, a, of an interest as well as a demand to get the underlying data that went into the research linked up to the published results. And whether you call it data citations or data um, slash software to literature links, we all need the metadata um, for in, in order to make these links possible. And here, you know, I didn't want to put in the full URL, but we have recently um, published a guide for publishers to deposit the data and software links. Um, feel free to take a look in our support site for more technical documentation. Today I'll just cover briefly, you know, what we're trying to do, the architecture um, of how it works, and um, just lay out in very simple terms two ways in which 
publishers as well as you as hosting platforms can deposit these data software citations or links. So we've been working with Datasite, our sister registration agency, because their membership, as you well know, are the data repositories that the data goes into. Um, and certainly we, so while we, with the publisher community, will get the metadata in on the article side, the data site and will, um, are, are bringing in all of the data literature links that come in from the data repository. And the hope is that by combining these two powerful infrastructure players together, as well as the metadata, we'll get a much more comprehensive view of what um, data software literature links there are out there. So the good news is that there are no substantial workflow changes required in order to actually get this to happen. Um, there are two ways in which this is possible, and each of them have their own benefits. Um, one of them is um, as well as limitations. So I won't go too deep into what, what um, the comparison of that is today, but I'm happy to to answer any questions afterwards um, or hook up with you guys um, offline. But the first method is one that has been promoted by the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles. This was a synthesis effort um, that was led by Force 11, which put, brought together many different groups working in the space, not only publishers, but also um, data repository organizations, governance organizations, to, um, to draft the set of principles um, in 2014. Since then, there have been many efforts to start implementing this, both on the data repository end as well as the publisher end. But the short of it is um, you can deposit your data citations using their recommendation by adding the data set or software as a reference in the references section so that they get included into your deposit um, when, when you register your content with Crossref as a reference. If the data, if the reference is a data site DOI, then we automatically make this link and share it out to the community. The limitation here, however, is that um, references being references, you stick it in, there might be, say, 30, 60, 100 references for a paper. How do we know which one is associated with data? or software, or which ones, and what kind. So the tricky thing with data is that it might be underlying data that was actually generated as part of the research itself, or in fact it might be an example of data reuse where a research group um, analyzed another research group's data and came up with other insights which they wrote up and then published. And that's a different class of data. Um, and so it's very hard to distinguish between those two in the references section, no less between data citations and, say, other types of assets or resources that are often included in references beyond journal articles, beyond books. There might be white papers, there might be conference slides, there might be other work, you know, um, standards um, or guidelines or blog posts, etc. So this leads us to method two, and in this one, it's really just including information or the metadata about the data citation or software citation into the XML which you deposit with us. We have a schema that already accommodates um, these data citation links, and here with the relationship type, you can specify whether or not the data was generated as part of this research or whether or not it was an analysis of other people's research and already previously published. This is very simple. It, it just merely extends the metadata that you're already depositing with us. And our metadata schema accepts this at the present moment. So just to keep going, um, once Crossref, as well as Datasite, collect these data literature links in our metadata, we propagate it out to the community so that anyone can access it through our APIs. And we, as you well know, we have a host of different types of APIs, different formats and interfaces um, so, um, so as to make it um, accessible by a wide variety of systems out there. The, um, this leads me to our, our second topic, which um, include preprints. So a second class of the links that we deal with are literature linking to other re associated research outputs. 
And you'll see that there is a whole host of things, data sets being one of them, because data is associated with an article as well as software. But so are protocols, materials, conference papers, published peer reviews, translations of the article, and um, as well as preprints. Preprints have become quite a topic in, in, in our researcher worlds, and they're increasingly um, um, used by researchers in order to be able to share results um, before the formal publication. This is what we call in this diagram the article nexus. And I think that's just a shorthand way to really visualize how any article that is on your platform is oftentimes connected to many, many different materials, some of which might be hosted on your platform, but oftentimes are elsewhere. Either way, um, in our metadata, we have the capacity for um, you to associate this research article with those other items, whether or not it's hosted on your platform or on other platforms. And all of this is done through what we call the relationship type. Um, and this is an example, a larger example, of um, what we were talking about with the second method in depositing data citations. But preprints, um, going back to the second topic, we launched this new content type um, in November of last year. And to date, we have now 9,434 preprints currently deposited. And we have an entire set of um, best practices and guidelines with regards to preprints. I think many of us understand the importance of being able to link a preprint to the formal publication after, once that has happened. And um, we, so part of our guideline is to have the preprint repository update their metadata whenever, um, as soon as that happens. So BioArchive, for example, um, um, has a preprint posted, say, three months, six months later, um, the journal article is published in Nature. BioArchive will then update not only their landing page on their website to include the link to the Nature article, but they also then update the metadata in our system so that anyone who pings us to get information about the preprint or the article itself will find out about the other's existence. This is a pairing that will forever remain once that metadata is updated in our system, which the preprint repositories do. So we're very excited about the preprint effort. If you do have any questions about the linking, et cetera, um, please, please um, do let us know during Q&A. This brings us to the third topic um, of event data. And the, this, they belong in a class that we call linking literature to the activities surrounding it. Many of you might have already heard about um, our new service, which we have not launched yet, called Crosser Event Data. We've, it's also been, um, in early, very early days, referred to as the DUI Event Tracker. But um, basically, when we launch, we will be offering metadata about the activities that happen on an article, whether it's before publication or after publication. Um, and specifically, these activities are happening on external platforms. So I'm sure that you know many of your customers, um, as well as yourselves, um, have you know would like to know what happens to the articles after they've been published. The, you know, increasingly researchers are sharing these these articles. Um, they're discussing in external platforms. They're making recommendations. They're um, obviously citing it in, in future work. They, be, they may be mentioning it in um, non-scholarly works. It might be written up in blogs or in mainstream media. And so what we will be doing is collecting, aggregating this data and making that available to the community as quote-unquote raw metadata. Now, there are um, just a kind of give you a glimpse when, um, of, of what this looks like. This is a slide which shows a smattering of what we call data sources. And the data sources are just the places, the external platforms where, which we go to in order to collect this data, where the activity is happening on their platform. Um, and this is just a smattering because um, there will be far more as we continue to develop um, the event data 
um, service after it is launched, it is a, it will be forever a continually um, uh, uh, growing and um, progressing service. Um, when we launch, it will be a smaller set of data sources, um, but we definitely are eager to hear about other sources that may not um, be available um, at, at launch and um, we'll feed that back into our product roadmap. But um, this here I'll just go over a few examples of how this might be useful. Um, data citations are happening after the publication um, is released into the world or prior to publication. And they may be coming from data repositories, you know, um, in say Figshare, it may be coming from a different repository like, like Dryad. Um, but because it's not happening on, through the publisher, um, this will be a channel by which these data citations then get mapped back into our um, complete corpus of metadata related to an article. Social media is pretty obvious. You know, there's a lot of um, shares on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. And um, while we may only be getting started with a small set of them, um, they are, I think, um, an area that is of much interest to many of the people that we have talked about. Um, Wikimedia is, is a very popular one. Increasingly, it is used as a place where um, not only the lay public, but also researchers are going to in order to get information about the world and um, research being an important part. Um, we see quite a lot of activity where research articles are being added as references into the Wikipedia pages. Sharing platforms where um, articles might be read and shared, those, um, those are definitely well within our, um, our, our idea of what event data is going to be doing um, once we launch. And blogs are, are an obvious um, next, um, next area too. So we've talked, we've done quite a lot of interviews to um, get a better sense as to how different stakeholders in our research ecosystem might end up using um, crossover event data once once it is launched. And um, here is just one example of how you as a hosting platform might find this data interesting and of value. Um, and you know this is just one example of many. So as you start thinking about how my, how this data might be useful, um, we we we, we be very interested in hearing more um, about actual stories um, and, and so forth. The one of the big pieces and and, and um, new new contributions to the space, which you know um, is quite populated at this point with altmetrics providers, um, etc., is that we are offering as an infrastructure player um, the trust of the consumers of this data. Um, where the records are coming in, how we pull them in, exactly what, um, what events um, are at the bottom of all of these numbers, say if they're rolled up and delivered to different consumer groups. Um, you know, there's a wide variety of uses to the extent that any of them gets used for business decisions. Um, I think we all agree that the, the raw data is really, really important in order to ensure reliability and ensure trust and integrity um, for any of the value-added work that, that goes on top. Um, so we call this evidence first. Um, the data aggregation has traditionally been and continues to be a black box, um, especially when it's coming from numerous locations. Um, some people talk about this as an evidence gap, this mysterious black hole between, say, the external platforms um, and those, con um, those services that are then sending it out and um, adding it into their, their, their metrics, et cetera, um, for their c customers. Evidence, the crossover event data um, are, goal is to fill this evidence gap by providing that full evidence record of every piece of external data, data that we receive. As you can well understand, this is a massive undertaking. Um, it's all the more because we are, we um, will be collecting event data for every single DOI in our corpus. At this point in time, it's over 86 million. So as you can um, 
imagine there's been quite a lot of work our technology team has been doing to scale up. But um, this evidence service will also be a big part of it, which not only gives you the events for these 86 million DOIs, but also all of the evidence that um, was um, that we collected in aggregating the raw data to provide um, to our co the community itself. So um, just to sum up event data, um, we want to make sure that people understand these aren't metrics. We're not in the business of doing that. We're not in the business of interpreting the, the event data. Um, our business is to collect it from the external platforms, make it easier so you don't have to um, go to, you know, say 10, 20, 30 different external platforms to fetch it, um, and then make it available to everyone. So it's open data. Um, you, as a potential consumer of the data and or other players, can then come in and interpret it and build things off of it. And I think, you know, to date, we've only begun to see a small smattering of ways in which this event data um, or some of the altmetrics data can be used. What I would really like to encourage you hosting platform is, um, platforms are to begin to think broader than just, say, adding up the number of, say, tweets and so forth and providing it on your platform. But think about ways in which this might be able to power discovery systems, power the ways in which you can better deliver the, the research that, it, uh, that are on your hosting platforms um, to the readers themselves. Um, whether those are customized based upon interest, discipline, um, date, topic, um, et cetera. Um, there's, there's a lot of re research that we just, that aren't getting to the readers because of the avalanche of, of, of new work that's being published every day. So I think I'll, I'll wrap with that. Um, event data is a big piece of it. Um, I know that's a little bit vague, but um, I think in the Q&A and our back and forth right now, we can dig a little bit deeper into what it actually means and how you guys might be able to use it. So let's open it up to questions. Hi, this is Jake Zarnagar. Um, I have a question around the time scale of the event data, when that's going to be rolling out. I, I, if you said it, I'm sorry, I missed it. No, no, not at all. That is a good question. I actually didn't hit at that. Um, we will be rolling this out to a small group of beta, beta cons, um, customers just to get a better sense of um, how useful it is and to fold that into um, our continued development of this. And I, th I think that it's, it will be around the April-May timeframe. So if you're interested in participating in beta, which is certainly you know, in beta service, meaning that the, um, the service reliability really won't be at its maximum until we fully formally launch. Don't worry, uh, you're talking to, you're a, talking to the platform hosters now. We, we understand beta. <laughs> very good, very good. Please do contact Jennifer Kemp um, if you're interested in partici participating in beta. We, do, we are, uh, you know, we, we expect that we will roll this out in full force later on this year, or certainly after beta. Okay, and just a quick follow-up, is there any time, uh, uh, obviously the, the actually seeing the service in action in beta is great, but just the schema itself and the, the data the API, is that going to be released kind of earlier as a draft? Because, um, you know, having time to prep for what might be in that feed is, is useful for us. Absolutely. So we can point you to, um, Jennifer and I will get together and she'll send out some documentation links to um, what is available online now. We have quite a bit already written up sharing out the, the schema of the metadata for the events. Okay, great. How many of you are already working with publishers who are depositing data citations or thinking about how to do it?
it, have, have it, has it come up as a topic in any of your conversations with your publishers? Uh, Jake, again, it's definitely come up. Um, we are not doing data uh, deposit in the Crossref right now. I mean, I think a lot of folks are using Figshare and other places to create a kind of ID record of their data that's separate from the from the article itself. Um, so I would be interested to see about depositing directly um, a separate record for the data the data objects because we're we're getting a lot more of them and they're starting to appear with nearly every nearly every article. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so just to um, um, I guess tease apart your statement. So we have data citations that are contained in an article, linking the article to any data objects that might be associated with the research itself. And on the other hand, um, to your point, there might also be data sets that your customers are interested in depositing as independent objects um, and then registering that, getting a DOI for that. Um, and it sounds like it's the latter that you've heard publishers are interested in more. Is that right? What, what, right. Well, I appreciate you clarifying that for me, making me sound smarter than, than I was. Um, now I'm starting to get the point. Uh, <laughs> the, we don't see nearly the amount of kind of prep reference tagging that would allow us to tease out which of the citations are data driven versus um, versus not data driven. So in other words, I, I think we struggle a bit because we're seeing a lot of these references looking exactly the same coming out of the publisher's production systems. Um, so we would need to push this upstream to them to get some unique identifiers into the way that they are tagging those citations so we'd even have a chance of depositing them separately um, as data citations. Right. That's 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 a good point, right? Upstream would be then the submission platforms um, in many cases, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky thing. The publisher needs to know, um, ultimately, what is a data citation, meaning um, what is the data set that's associated with the article in order for all of this, any of this to happen. Um, well, aside from merely just stuffing it into the references, but then we have the problem of that reference looking exactly the same as all the other references. In order to go with the second method, which is to formally tag this specifically as a data set, a specific type of data set, then you're right, um, the, the publisher would need to know. And I think increasingly publishers are talking about creating data availability sections in their papers. I don't know if, if you guys have heard this as well. We've, um, I've talked, I've certainly talked to a number of the bigger publishers who are thinking ahead. You know, all of this is somewhat, well, it's relatively new in the sense that from the standpoint of implementation, it's not completely in place yet. Not all publishers have even started thinking about how to do it. Not so relative new in that there have been people trying to get data citations going for five to ten years. Um, but yeah, data availability sections as an actual separate part of the paper is something that we've heard a lot of publishers um, will want to do in the future because then you treat it as its own thing and then you know specifically what data sets are specifically data sets. That would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, I, um, if I can just jump in for a minute, this is the this is the other Jennifer. Um, the submission systems are also fall into the service provider category that I mentioned earlier. Um, so they are obviously you know very much involved in sort of creating or, or handing off uh, metadata, and it's it's one of the reasons that we're trying to work to kind of connect the dots um, in some of these situations. You know, obviously some some publishers are more um, involved than others, so. Um, it's it's good to sort of get this feedback, and if there are any kind of conversations to facilitate, then you know I'm 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 happy to help with that because there is this sometimes it's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario, as as, as I'm sure you know about you know what what publishers hear and what they hear it from, and and when they can and start um, you know to, to cr creating some of this metadata and, and and what to prioritize over others because the the um, 
the, the metadata that we require, you know, that's, that's strictly required for deposits is actually fairly uh, basic. Um, but we incur we have all so much other metadata that can be deposited. This is obviously some of the stuff that Jennifer was talking about. And we really do encourage publishers uh, more and more to provide as much um, metadata as possible. But of course, when I say that, I say, you know, publishers providing it, but there are also obviously these sort of partners along the way. So these kinds of conversations are very helpful for us. Yeah, absolutely. And we hope they're helpful for you, too. I mean, I think in the data space, we're seeing quite a lot of movement from the funders themselves, which are then going to trickle down and have an impact um, eventually, not only to the publishers, but to their vendors. And the way that the funders have are impacting the space is that they are increasingly require not only um, that the results themselves be made publicly available, but also that the data that's associated with the results be done as well um, on top of that, which means that linking the data as to the article then becomes a big priority. So um, we're very keen to build on the, the connections that we're establishing today that Jennifer has already established with each of you just to give you kind of um, keep you guys ahead of the curve um, with an eye out to what's coming up more and more as these things become more formal and uh, sorry more popular and, and widespread. What about preprints? What are you guys hearing from your publishers? Are there are there um, anxieties surrounding preprints? Are there interest in starting new preprint servers? Anything in this space that you're hearing? I guess not so much. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, on our end, um, when we were rolling this out, there have been, um, in the past two years, quite a lot of concern that from the publishers that, you know, if these preprint repositories become really popular, um, how do we make sure that any journal articles that are formally published and after they go under peer review and, and all the work that we've done to enrich and, um, and improve the research results to make it fully dis you know, um, disclosed and, 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 you know, meet ethical standards, et cetera. All of the work that, that we're doing, we want it to be linked up to any other previous versions of it. Um, and so we, you know, spent a lot of time talking to publishers saying um, preprints will be linked. Um, they, um, they can, in fact, make your jobs a lot easier because, you um, during the submission process, if there's a prior preprint, you can have all of that metadata automatically populate into your system and have that then get um, pushed down your, um, your publishing pipeline. But I think the linking is a big thing, and if there are any questions about how that happens, um, please, please do raise them, how we can make it easier, et cetera. Jennifer, just a, a quick question. So the DOI is established at the moment of preprint, and then when the article, when the kind of article of record comes out, it's going to share that preprint DOI, but then deposit it as a different type. And so you'll get more of that article, or is it going to be a different DOI? It will be a different DOI, yes. Okay. Our best practice recommendation in general, um, and this equally applies to preprints, is that any time that you have any a significant change to the interpretation of the work, as well as the any changes to the contributors, um, that merits the assignment of a new DOI. When we're talking about versions, with with respect to preprints, it is actually slightly different. Um, I take that. Back. It's slightly different because we, you know, I think the research community treats it as a completely different intellectual output, scholarly contribution. And it just works out technically that way as well because most publishers aren't, um, most preprints are on platforms that um, are very different than, say, the publisher platform of the article or record. Right. Okay.
any other questions about <clears throat> anything that Jennifer or I covered or, or anything else? Any other cross-ref questions while, I, while we're together here? Okay. Well, you can certainly always get in touch with us um, afterwards at any time. Great. Well, thank you all for your time today. I'm very excited about the event data, and I look forward to, to seeing it as you roll it out. I'm sure we'll be in contact uh, uh, off this call. Okay, great. And I, I hope those of you on the East Coast are staying warm and dry. <laughs> you we'll, we'll send out links to the event data technical documentation after this call. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.